Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Farron Cousins, and for Mike Papantonio this week. Coming up on today's show, we'll find out why the Tea Party seems to be failing as both a political movement as well as a social movement. The Pentagon has accepted the science behind climate change, so now they've become a target for science-denying Republicans. We'll bring you the latest on that story. And we'll revisit Pap's conversation with Bobby Kennedy on the history of corporate fraud against the government. That's all coming up, so stay tuned. You've just entered the Ring of Fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. (laughs) The Tea Party's recent rally to oust President Obama showed just how politically impotent the group has become. But it isn't just the Tea Party. The Republican Party is becoming more and more irrelevant as the American public is beginning to see just how socially, economically, and politically backwards the party is today. Joining me now to talk about this is Howard Nations. Howard, Paul Waldman writing for the American Prospect, and and he is a, a great friend of Ring of Fire. He's been on this show many times, but he recently laid out some of the more serious problems facing the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. Uh, explain to us a little bit about what's happening with the Tea Party at the moment. Well, in the good old days, in the smoke-filled rooms of politics, the party itself would get together and work out differences, and then they would come, they have big combat, but then they'd come together, and their public face was always the same. Now, with the Tea Party, it's completely different. Today's battle is between the establishment Republicans and the Tea Party Republicans. It's very high profile, very heavily financed, and their strategy is their usual circular firing squad. And uh, they've, uh, you know, they, they've spent a lot of time going after, you know, some of the well-established GOP members, uh, Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell recently, and, you know, the, the establishment seems to be coming out ahead right now, but <laughs> you never know what can happen when all this money starts flowing in from the Cokes, who are very heavily behind the Tea Party. Very much so. As a matter of fact, watching the Republican primaries versus the general election today is kind of like going to a movie where you go to see a good uh, conservative film, but you have to sit through a Looney Tune cartoon before you get to it. Well, that's the Tea Party part of it. Uh, there's so much unrest in the hinterlands right now that they are they're attacking their own. They've turned against Marco Rubio. Most recently, the South Carolina Charleston County Republican Committee censured Senator Lindsey Graham, their sitting Republican senator. The reason they censured him, he's not conservative enough. Can you imagine that meeting where they called to order the Tea Party? They say, okay, who can we hate today? What legislation can we block? Well, there's not any. Obamacare is not going to get repeal. There's no serious dem- Democratic candidates in South Carolina to vilify. The birther issue has been preempted by Trump. Benghazi and, and Hillary have been copyrighted by Fox News and the National Republican candidates. Any ideas? Yeah, I saw that social liberal Graham mingling with a bunch of Democratic senators right there on the floor of the Senate. That's good enough, less censoring. So they pledge allegiance to Ted Cruz and the Second Amendment, and the meeting's adjourned. That's a, that's a fairly typical Tea Party meeting today. And the, the Tea Party itself is not the only group facing problems. Once you get over into the establishment, I mean, they're starting to see some real, real problems materialize for them uh, as, as their base just, you know, refuses, not just their base, their elected officials, refuse to evolve with society. So what's happening with the establishment right now? Well, what's happening primarily is that you've got people who the establishment has been moved to the right. Uh, The establishment is the Speaker of the House, but the Speaker of the House with only 70 Tea Party members in the House out of 435 can't control that contingent. So they have forced him to move to the right. They've moved the entire establishment to the right. As the entire establishment moves to the right, they lose contact with the general public. They lose contact with the trending in social and economic issues today. So the the whole issue of the Tea Party, are they successful? They define success as shutting down the government completely. But are they successful? Yes, they're successful because they have dragged the 
t establishment Republicans so far to the right that they can't win a general election. And, you know, uh, uh, Al Jazeera America recently put together a fantastic article. You know, they, they pulled all these poll numbers that you're not going to see on, on Fox News. You're not going to see anywhere in the corporate media. But they really laid out the fact that the current GOP slash Tea Party slash whatever you want to call them right now, uh, they're having a serious problem because this younger generation, these new voters that are moving up through the system, they're not getting behind the, the Republicans on, on really any issues right now, are they? The Republican establishment is getting very definitely out of touch with the public today. The polls are still in their favor, but they're trending strongly against them. For example, in the current polling on values and beliefs, on the social issues, the Gallup poll shows that 34% identify as, as conservatives, 35% uh, of voters identify as moderates, and 30, only 30% 30 identify as liberals. Well, that's a plus 4% for conservatives. However, in, as recently as 2009, 2010, it was a plus 17% for conservatives. Uh, the Republicans since 2009 have remained the same. However, the Democrats have become more liberal, uh, especially on matters such as same-sex marriage and, and legal marijuana. The overall significant shift to the left has occurred since the uh, Obama election. And the bottom line today is that conservative ideology is still dominant, but it's shrinking significantly. And the more Democrats are self-identifying as liberals. And I think, uh, I, I think a large part of it is the fact that we did have that, this major economic meltdown that uh, for a large part of it was brought by nothing more than Wall Street greed and handouts to the 1%. And that is... Republican economic policy. That's Republican economic policy dating back to the 1940s. They, they haven't changed in, in, in 70 plus years. And uh, just real quick, we've got about 30 seconds. Do you see any change for them on the horizon? Are these poll numbers going to wake them up at all? Let me tell you what the changes are on the horizon. The keys to the future are the millennials. 75 million Americans who age 17 to 32, so they're almost all into voting age right now, 35% are non-white, they're more liberal, they're more democratic, and this group feels that the federal government should be doing more for them, should be more involved in their life. And as they completely come completely into voting age, it will be exactly what President Obama proved. When you win the millennials, you win elections and the millennials are being lost on every possible front by the Republican current policies. I agree completely, Howard Nations. Thank you so much for being with us today. For several years, the Pentagon has been warning the American public that climate change poses a very real threat to our national security. They recently issued this warning again in a new report, and the science-denying wing of the Republican Party has now lashed out at one of their favorite institutions as a result. Joining me to talk about this is Mike Berg. So, Mike, I guess when you look at the stories, it would appear that the Pentagon has been taken over by these tree-hugging liberal hippies who want us all to think that, that climate change is a, is a threat to us. Uh, I don't think the Republicans are going to accept that. Do you? Well, no. In fact, they've declared war on America. It's, a, it's really crazy. 227 Republicans have voted uh, to take the defense budget and make sure that none of the money itself can go to what they've been working on for years, which is where the biggest problems are, which is going to be caused by climate change. People, countries fighting over water, uh, countries, you know, fighting over whether or not they can grow food. Uh, climate change is here. It's a reality. Mike, this is not the first time that the Pentagon has come out and said that we need to be concerned about climate change. They've been saying this as far back as 2006. And, you know, keep in mind, 2006, we had George W. Bush in office. That was the uh, before the midterm elections where the uh, Democrats took over Congress. So we had all branches of government controlled by Republicans, controlled by the oil industry. And they still said, no, guys, listen, climate change is real. It's here. It's happening. It's a threat. So why, why now are we seeing these 227 Republicans say, okay, we've got to stand up and stop this? 
Well, the problem is, is these are these are climate change deniers. When 16 retired admirals and generals from the Pentagon step up and say, look, we need to take this into account. We need to be working on this. Today, it's, it's all the negativity from the Republican Party. Here, they don't want to deal with climate change. Basically, they want to just eat up the earth through fracking, through oil, through all the things they're doing, which is releasing the carbons. Uh, you know, the administration is trying to get this, at least take some steps to try to do what we can to prevent the seas from, from, from rising, uh, which the naval base, the generals and the admirals are already saying that's potentially a problem, not to mention all the other famine and flooding and, and fires that we are seeing throughout the world today that is unprecedented. And I think that's a very important point to hit on is the fact that these are not some far off concepts. These are not things that uh, are going to happen 10, 20, 30 years from now. These are things that are happening to this country right now. We've seen areas that haven't frozen over in, in decades that froze this winter for days. And now those same areas are experiencing a record heat wave, record flooding. Uh, as a perfect example, I, I live in Pensacola, Florida. We have had all of those things in the span of four months, none of which have ever happened here, at least not in my lifetime. And they still want to come out and say, no, this is not true. This is not real. This is not happening. It's about the money, the, the, the financial cost of trying to fix uh, the, or trying to do what we can to help repair the climate change issues. The, the deniers don't want the money to be spent in that area because they don't really care. And that's for sure. They don't care about what this earth is going to look like for our children and our grandchildren. What they care about is how much money can we make sure that the big boys are going to be making out of drilling and getting oil out of the ground and the coal and the fumes and the carbon footprint. That's what they're interested in, money. And what's interesting, and I want to just say this, you know, there's that old thing, Farron, where, uh, you know, and, and it's I'll be coming back to reality. History repeats itself. We know Nero fiddled why Rome burned. It, it burned because of the Huns, but it didn't burn because of uh, climate change. Right now, the Republicans are fiddling while the earth is burning. And, and that is a disaster for this country. It is. And it, to, to have these 227 members of the House of Representatives that come forward and say, we're going to cut your budget, Pentagon. You cannot spend any of the money, money that we do give you doing anything to prevent this planet from burning. And as you pointed out, this is all about the money because those 227 members are all being funded by the oil industry, the Koch brothers, Exxon, BP, all of these major players in oil, gas, fracking, uh, coal, they're all 100% behind these guys. And the question is, how do we fight that money? We've got about a minute left. Well, the only way to fight it is to have the public up in arms, going out and, and writing to their senators, writing to their House of Representatives and saying, no, I care about my children. I care about my grandchildren. I care about the planet. And you know what? For once, we're siding with the Pentagon. The Democrats are siding with the Pentagon. We're saying today, take the steps to do what we can to bring this world together to fight this, to save the earth. And, and there's really no question about it. 97% of, of all scientists, 97%. What's amazing is on TV, you get one person who says, I deny client change. And you have one person who says there is climate change. I'd like to see, let's, let's make it equal. Let's get 97 people in a room to say what the truth is and get the three deniers there. Maybe we can get some change that way. Well, that would certainly be great if that could happen. But the, the, the biggest problem is that climate change has become a partisan issue, and it's not a partisan issue. There is no debate. We know it's there. We know it's happening. And the Republicans are the ones who have politicized this. Mike Berg, thank you so much for telling us the story today. Thank you, Farron. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Hi, I'm Mike Papantonio, host of Ring of Fire on Free Speech TV. The corporate controlled media rakes in millions of dollars in profit every year by only telling you half of the story. They're at the mercy of their corporate sponsors and they refuse to take on corporations that kill, maim, and harm consumers. 
Here at Free Speech TV, we don't have shareholders. We don't answer to corporate America, and we don't pull any punches. Our loyalty is to the viewers, and our viewers are the ones that help keep Free Speech TV alive. Free Speech TV doesn't take corporate money, and that's why your financial support is so important to us. Viewer voices, not corporate sponsors, fuel Free Speech TV and drive many of our programming decisions. You can help protect Free Speech TV with your donation. Free Speech TV airs independent news and views for independent thinkers like you. Our people-powered programs demonstrate what's possible in our democracy when we unite as workers, as students, as artists, as parents, and partners in progress. More people means more power. Each donation brings more power and programs and more possibilities for change. Our programming equips viewers with vital tools, resources, contacts, and examples of how to collectively build alternative, sustainable solutions to serious community problems. Please donate now and bring these organizing tools into your community. Everyone should have access to news and information that's forming the world around them. Our goal is to keep you and everybody involved. We aim to reach every viewer possible because we're all in this together. Go online to freespeech.org and help support independent, honest news journalism. Your support helps keep information flowing and together we can hold the corporate media more accountable. We're back on Ring of Fire. I'm Farron Cousins and for Mike Papantonio this week. Not long ago, Mike Papantonio and Bobby Kennedy Jr. sat down to discuss the growing problem of corporate fraud against the government. Every year, billions upon billions of dollars are granted to contractors on behalf of the U.S. government, and the system is completely riddled with fraud. Let's listen now to Mike and Bobby talk about that growing problem. Pap, I want to talk to you about the Glaxo settlement because this is a, an area that both you and I have tremendous experience in. It's really an historic settlement for our country. Well, it's an important settlement, but understand Glaxo got all the headlines. This is a, this is a, whistle, a, a classic whistleblower case. It got all the headlines, but the Glaxo kind of fraud within the pharmaceutical industry goes on all the time. It's, it, it's actually interesting to me that Glaxo got so much publicity because there's been huge cases where you've had drug companies do exactly the same thing that Glaxo did here. But I think it's more important to understand, really, how, what is a whistleblower case? For, how, how did the Glaxo case come out? It didn't come out because they volunteered it. It came out by two people who I, I call them patriots because they had enough courage to understand that the conduct by this company was deplorable. What's the history of this? Well, and it, 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 the history is really interesting. As you know, and you and I have done a lot of these cases over the years. You're one of the country's experts in these kind of cases. But I think we really need to talk about it because the, the statute that regulates, that allows whistleblowers, that protects whistleblowers and rewards them for this kind of conduct is now under attack by a Congress that is essentially owned by corrupt corporations. And the history, as you know, Pap, is really, is, you know, this, the whistleblower protection statutes are, have become a foundation stone of American democracy. And if you look at the success of democracies around the world, the biggest enemy of democracy is government corruption. It's when people lose their faith in the government. And that happens, that, that temptation is always there when you have private corporations dealing with government officials. Um, the, the whistleblower, the first whistleblower statute was passed by Abraham Lincoln. It was called the Lincoln Law during the Civil War, and he did it because of corruption among military contractors. At that time, people were selling uh, bad mules to the American government. They were selling shoes that didn't have soles on them. They were selling adulterated foods that would make our soldiers sick. They were selling weapons that were defective and ammunition that just didn't work. It became, that kind of corruption became so pervasive that Lincoln passed a law that said not only is it illegal and we're going to provide for heavy fines, but we're also going to give protection the people who work for those corporations, if they come forward and expose to the government that the corporation is stealing from the American taxpayer and stealing from the American people. And 
Lincoln understood that people who work for these companies are reluctant to do that because of the extraordinary opportunity for retaliation that these well, companies Well, let, let but, but let me point out, even when Lincoln started this, uh, in 1863, when Lincoln said, we need a law that empowers the average citizen to come forward and say, um, and, and at that point, you understand, Lincoln, uh, the, the law was such that the government could do it, but it had not gone as far as saying the individual can do it. Uh, it didn't have that kind of freedom. It's evolved, it it's, it, it's, it's evolved to the point now to where an individual can, can get a company like Glaxo, for example. They can say, what you're doing is, it, it, it may not just, mo- most whistleblowers don't do this because they get paid a percentage. In the Glaxo case, it's a three, it was a $3 billion settlement, and obviously the two people who brought that case, they get paid a percentage of it. But if you look at why they really did it, and, and it's very typical of, I, I even hate to see these people called whistleblowers, I call them patriots, because sometimes they are the only people standing in between that caliber of corruption that we saw, not just with Glaxo, but we see with, with, with drug companies all the time. We see it with the military armaments industry. We see it with oil companies. With the oil companies, um, with, uh, with, with banks particularly. Yeah. Who are, uh, who are doing, have all these kind of foreclosure and mortgage scams where they will sell, for example, veterans. Veterans are under the law. Veterans' mortgages are secured and they're guaranteed uh, and insured by the federal government. So this gives the banks an opportunity to overcharge the veterans for their home, to, evaluate, to assess it as much greater value, which makes it much more likely that they're going to foreclose, and then they get the money at the end. Bobby, let me give you a quick history. I mean, you know this history. You know this case. Uh, you've been doing this as long as I have. To me, the most compelling case is, there's several of them, but this one comes to my mind. Had there been a whistleblower, had somebody come forward and said, what you're doing is wrong, had somebody gone to Bear, let me use Bear, Bear, uh, Bear Industries, for example, company in Berlin doing business here in the United States, they sell aspirin, that's how they're known, Bear Aspirin. But what about the case where Bear had a product called Factor 8? They had a product that was made for hemophiliacs. They were, they were children, mostly uh, children, who were suffering uh, as hemophiliacs. They, they said, well, we have a product called Factor Eight, which will stop your bleeding when you have a dramatic bleed. It'll stop it. You're going to be okay. What they didn't tell the children and they didn't tell the parents is the product that they were getting from the way that they were making it It was adulterated, and it was actually infected with AIDS virus, okay? Now, thousands of people died throughout this country. A child would get the AIDS virus from Factor Eight. It would spread throughout the household. The mother would die. The father would die. The brothers and sisters would die. Entire families were wiped out. Had there been a whistleblower, the bear would not have done the next thing that they did. And it's it's deplorable. But they stopped, they, they were told you can't sell it in America anymore. So they took their stock of Factor 8 and they sent it overseas. The same stuff that was killing people in America, they then sent it overseas. Now, thousands of lives were lost. When you talk to most people who are whistleblowers, they don't do this because they know they get 20% of $3 billion. They don't do it for that reason. They do it because in their mind, they understand that if they don't take action, lives will be lost, taxpayers will lose huge amounts of money, and our democracy, if you think about it, is at risk. It's, it's like when, it's when Abraham Lincoln, I love, you tell the Abraham Lincoln quote, the bankers are in back of me and the, what was that? He said, in 1863, during the height of the Civil War, Lincoln said, I have the South in front of me and the bankers behind me, and for my nation, I fear the bankers more. Right. So he, you know, he understood the, uh, the, the liabilities and the peril of corporate domination of those concentrations of power in a democratic system. And, there, and you and I know there are lots of good corporations out there. Tons and of them, there's yeah. lots of them in the healthcare industry yeah. that just want to help people. 
But because of the huge amounts of money that are now involved in this system, there are also people who are willing to steal from the federal government. And the scope of this law has expanded so that it's now no longer limited to military contractors. Uh, it's, it's been used against oil companies. It's been used against banks. But probably uh, the, the largest area of corruption that we're seeing today is consistently coming out of, of health care providers. And, it's, uh, and again, it's a black eye to the whole industry. It's a black eye to the industry and to the people who are trying to do good things with that industry. But now it's under attack. Right now you have right. the lobbyists in Washington that want to stop it. The whistleblower statute historically was really the first statue of the, uh, uh, of the progressive movement and the populist movement in our country. It was the first time that government said, wait a second, there's so much corruption and there's so much concentration of wealth that it is actually threatening our democracy. So, yeah, as a matter Lincoln of fact... saw that, but today you have the people who are fighting it on Capitol Hill, which are the usual kind of parade of, of, of you know, of... Uh, of horrors, you've got the Heritage Foundation, you have the Chamber of Commerce with $50 million that they're putting into these efforts. Um, you have the Cato Institute, you have the Koch brothers, you have all of these very okay. right wing why, why is... that are trying to protect but... corporate power and to suppress democracy by, by making sure that if somebody reports corruption by a corporation that they're working for, that that person is going to be punished Rather than reward. Yeah, so why is it all out war? Let, let's, let's state what it is. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce doesn't like the whistleblower law. Why would they? Because the, what they're trying to do is, is protect corrupt corporations. If you're not a corrupt corporation, you don't mind the whistleblower law here in the United States. But the first thing we're seeing right now, because, I mean, if you're, if you're an honest company, you don't have anything to hide. It's the corrupt companies that the, the, the Chamber of Commerce really is putting a lot of effort to try to protect. Now, wh where are they going? The first place they're going is to Wall Street, okay? They're trying to protect Wall Street. Wall Street stole, stole from the American public in one form or fashion around $13 trillion. That's what they stole from mom-and-pop taxpayers in the last meltdown. So now you have the Chamber of Commerce trying to say, we need to change the Dodd-Frank law, where there is the right in Dodd-Frank for, for an insider to report corruption, okay? So it's not, it's not, the, it's not completely a whistleblower statute, but it, is, it gives a person working inside well, a bank... There's a provision in Dodd-Frank that is a whistleblower provision that extends whistleblower protection to Wall Street, essentially. Right. And that, it allows people who are, um, you know, banks that are defrauding veterans, that are defrauding the American public, that are stealing from the American people, that it allows people who are working for those banks to report their employer and then come in and collect up to a third of the money. What if you had been the person that, that – what if you had been the person that came forward – and, and reported that Barclay and a dozen other companies, a dozen of other banks, were controlling interest rates, were gaming the interest rate system all over the globe. What if you had come forward and you said, I'm the person who reports that? First of all, a great thing would have been accomplished because we would have, we would have stopped the worst corruption in American history, where the banks have gamed the interest system, to where people pay more for their mortgages, people pay more for their home. It, 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 across the board, affected everybody on the globe, not just in America. That's the first thing. The second, the, the second most important thing about that is the whistleblower, obviously, would be rewarded for by 20%, 15 to 20% of that recovery. But what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants to do is make it impossible for that whistleblower to come forward and report it. Here's what they're doing. They're saying before you come forward, you have to extinguish all possibilities of reporting that theft, of reporting that fraud to every part of our company. In other words, you have to call in the hotline and say, my name's Joe Smith and I want to report something. Well, that doesn't protect... You have to go to your, to your boss. You have you to. Have, and your boss may be involved in the corruption. Exactly. 
you have to go to your colleagues. And they, the uh, Federal Corrupt Practices Act makes it illegal for American firms to bribe foreign officials in order to get an advantage when they go to those com- com- countries. Um, in most cases, the people who know about that payment would be only maybe two or three right. very, very high-level people. Under the Chamber of Commerce proposition, the guy who wants to report that corruption would first have to go and tell the people who are actually making the payoffs. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and it would give a blueprint to that company of how to stifle, to punish, to retaliate, or to discredit that person. They'll say, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll fire him for drunkenness. Right. They'll fire him for alcoholism. They'll fire him for, fire him for some dreamed-up uh, 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 malfeasance that will be used in the future to say, oh, well, that person was a disgruntled employee. That's the only reason. Well, I want to talk about that in the next segment. I want to talk about what they do to whistleblowers. But let me, let me tell you this. I have actually seen cases where people, where you have a corporation and a whistleblower comes forward and the people at the top don't really know what's going on. They really don't. They don't have any idea. Or secondly, they don't think it's wrong. I've actually seen corporations that have said, you know what, this law is so important for democracy that I'm going to go ahead and pay. I, I, you know, we messed up. I hate that we messed up. We didn't do it. Somebody down below did it. But it was our corporation. The buck stops with us. And we're going to pay it anyway. That's decency. Most corporations don't play like that. Most corporations do, do everything they can not to be decent, not to pay when sometimes they think, well, you know, Maybe we didn't do anything wrong. We didn't know about it. It really wasn't our fault. But this is an important thing, and we're going to pay it. Let's just, so the audience understands why this is important and how it affects their lives. Let's talk about what happens in some of these pharmaceutical cases. You are the leading expert on pharmaceutical litigation in the country. Um, what happened in Glaxo? Well, Glaxo. And, why, and, and particularly, why is it important to a taxpayer who may never get sick in their lives? Yeah. Glaxo is probably the classic example of a whistleblower case that explains everything about why it's important. Here's what happened. You had a company that had completely put profits above decency. Two people working in Glaxo were, were going to the company and saying, what you're doing on many different levels is not just morally wrong, it's illegal. What they were doing, one thing that they would do, Bobby, is they would take one of their drugs and they would sell it to a doctor, and they would say, doctor, prescribe this drug for something that it's not supposed to be prescribed for. And they would pay the doctor to actually tell his patients that's a good thing. And now, that's called an off-label usage. It's called usage. off-label usage. As a matter of fact, the off-label problem with Glaxo was so bad that they were taking drugs that had not even been approved for use with children. And they were selling the drugs to children. The Glaxo knew that they were doing that. Glaxo knew that the drug had potential to kill the children they were selling to, but they were increasing their profits by increasing their market. That's and the- what we know now is that in the pharmaceutical industry, 20% of their profits come from off-label usage. Yes. And so there's a huge incentive program with some of these companies to get their sales represent- representatives to do something that's illegal, which is to try well, to prescribe drugs that may be dangerous for a certain cohort. Well, let me, say, let me tell you about what else Glaxo did, though. It, was, it wasn't just off-label. They would actually go out and pay doctors. Glaxo would actually write, the, the, they would write an article for a, a, a medical periodical. They would write an article for a magazine. They'd have the doctor sign off on the article as if he wrote it. They would simply make up and say for that doctor whatever they wanted, that scientist, that doctor. I call him a biostitute. And, 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 right, and the article would say this drug, although it is, it is approved and designed for this purpose, is also effective exactly. for children. Exactly. Even though, and the doctor is not actually breaking the law by prescribing it to a child. Well, the, doc- the doctor, well, first of all, the doctor... But it's, doc- illi- the doc- it's illegal for the company it had- to tell the doctor to do that. Exactly. There's no, let me just tell you something. There is no decent doctor 
who would or should do that. There's no, but, I, but nevertheless, I think they, they found over 40,000 doctors that were willing to say, yeah, we'll push the limits on, it wasn't just one drug, it was several different drugs. We'll push the limits on prescribing this drug. What are you going to pay me? Now, it didn't end there. When you can go out and you can find a scientist that will sign their name to something, a doctor... They were, incidentally, they were paying doctors enormous amounts of money. Huge, yeah. Up to $248,000 in one case with Dr. Drew to recommend it on his radio station. Right, right. For an off-label use. Well, okay, so, so the what... Money, so what, the temptation for the doctors is huge, too. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong is the whistleblowers in this case... Now understand, these were two courageous individuals... Who, uh, who said, you know, I've got to come forward because human life is at risk. Uh, I don't like what my company's doing. What they're doing is illegal. They're, over, they're overcharging Medicare for some of this stuff. Their, the, 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 their, their message to the American public is a lie. We've seen it time and time again. We've seen it with Yaz. We've seen it with Vioxx. We've seen it with... Uh, we, I could go on forever, all the companies that we've seen do this. Now, not all of those times... Was there a whistleblower involved? Let me tell you what happens to most whistleblowers, just so it's full disclosure. The, the, reason, the reason the people in this case, and in, in all the cases, they get paid a percentage of what the government collects. In this one, it was $3 billion. So the whistleblower gets a percentage of that. Well, they, they can get up to 30%. The, well, they get now, as a practical matter, Bobby, it's going to be somewhere between 15 right. to 20. But the point is, the point is this. These whistleblowers are always subject to attack. They're, they're, matter of fact, this is, most people don't know this. The person who came up with the idea of how to attack whistleblowers was none other than Richard Milhouse Nixon. Nixon, Nixon came up with a manual right. in his administration, had a manual. The Malik manual. The Malik manual on right. how we will discourage whistleblowers. And what he did is he said, well, here's some things we should do. You send them to bureaucratic Siberia, you demote them, you eliminate their jobs, um, you isolate them. Uh, you, and it, and it, was a, it was a formula. It was a how-to. For how to stop people from talking. And that's one of the interesting things that we need to talk about at some point is why is there this kind of sweetheart relationship between government and the corporations with whom they do business so that... The government, because Nixon was actually in that in that tape, he was trying to protect a military contractor right. who was stealing from the American right. people. Right. Right. Let me tell. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you that this this the whistleblower statute. That's history is is incredibly important. Starts out with with the Lincoln Law, as you as you as you've talked about. But then what happened in 1943? The businesses, the big corporations in America that were dishonest said this law scares us. So they basically took the teeth out of the law and the, the government was ripped off billions and billions of dollars during that time that, that they took it away. And then in the 1980s... 1986. 1986, you had, uh, you had the government found out, well, the armaments industry is billing us $700 for a toilet seat. The, the drug industry... Or $500 for a hammer. Exactly. Or the drug industry was getting away with murder on what they were charging the government. Uh, you had the oil industry taking advantage of the government. You had the oil industry, Bobby. No royalty the, They weren't paying royalties. And so all of a sudden... Between, so they were drilling oil on federal land. They were supposed to pay royalties, but they were ripping off the government. Exactly. For and billions of talking. dollars. And the only, the only people who solved that problem were whistleblowers. It wasn't government that caught it. It wasn't regulators that caught it. Government, th these corporations didn't come forward and freely admit that they were stealing from American taxpayers and are pu putting people's lives. How about this? How about where you had a whistleblower? I can't even count the number of American soldiers' lives that were probably saved by a whistleblower coming forward and say, you know what? We're selling these flares. They're called, they're, they're combat flares. They shoot them up in the air. It, what it does is it opens the field to where a soldier can see what's going on. The problem is the damn things were blowing up. Right, and he'd, be carrying the, he'd be carrying the floor. It would blow up and kill everybody. They, if they were dropped more than 10 feet, they would ignite. They'd ignite. And they were killing people who were not using them but just carrying them around. Exactly. So a whistleblower, again, came forward and solved that problem. But let me just tell you something. The, the real trick... 
that we see these corporations use. And Richard Nixon and, and his people came up with how to discredit a whistleblower. You know what they said? Make the story about the whistleblower, not the conduct about what the corporation has done. In other words, misdirect the discussion. Make the discussion about the guy who's trying to come forward and say something wrong's taking place here. Make, make, make the story about him doing something wrong. Make him look like he's greedy because he wants his 20% of the billion dollars. Make him look like he's an incompetent uh, employee. Make him look like he's a bad guy. And in the end, what happens, Bobby, is people are discouraged from doing what could save lives, number one. And secondly, they're discouraged from saving taxpayers billions of dollars. It is no surprise to me that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce will do everything they can to return this, to return this law to the 1940s when government, could st- when government was being stolen from, from the oil industry, from the health care industry, from the drug industry, uh, virtually from the armaments industry. Uh, every year we're losing issues. billions of dollars. Pap, we were talking earlier about the campaign by these right-wing cadre of, of, um, of corporate dominationists on Capitol Hill, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, uh, the Koch brothers, uh, worst of all, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, to try to undermine whistleblower protection in this country, to make well, it possible. And, and, the, and the methods that they, they kind of uh, – the methods – whereby they allow the corporation, they put the power to investigate and to control the investigation into the hands of the corporation, which uses these methods that we talked about before, isolating the, the whistleblower, uh, making the whistleblower, giving the whistleblower impossible jobs and making it, uh, giving them a record that undermines their own credibility, making them appear as a disgruntled employee, sending them to bureaucratic Siberia, and also, one of the things I wanted you to talk about is the psychological testing, because that's really nefarious and kind of yeah, malevolent. As you point out, they put so many roadblocks in front of the whistleblower right there within the corporation. You know, it wouldn't surprise me for every one whistleblower that comes forward, there are a thousand who are discouraged. And the way they're discouraged is, as you point out, they some of the ideas is, you know, to make the issue about the whistleblower, to discredit the whistleblower. But one thing they do is they try to uh, make the whistleblower look like the whistleblower's crazy. One, one thing they'll do is they'll load the whistleblower up, for example, with, uh, with a project that's almost impossible. And nobody else could do the project. Uh, they'll, they'll make it virtually, uh, it's a setup for failure. In the process, they'll bring the whistleblower in. Somebody with, the, with human resources will be interviewing the whistleblower. What's going wrong in your life? Why can't you do this? And they'll create a record. And what they're trying to do is create this nefarious record to make it look like the whistleblower is having psychological problems, doesn't, is really not in touch with reality. I've seen, I've seen, a, I've seen yeah, actually, a half a dozen uh, cases like that where inside the corporation they try to make the whistleblower look crazy because they realize that the whistleblower is the only person who can stop them from stealing. And they actually have outside consulting firms that come in and specialize yeah. in doing these investigations yeah. and doing psychiatric evaluations of the whistleblower that will make them look like a nut job. Yeah, one thing they do, this is, this is we've seen this, I, I know, I, I've, I've seen on a couple of cases, where what they do with the whistleblower is they assign what they call a babysitter. Now, the babysitter is somebody who is a corporate toady. That corporate toady will do whatever they're ordered to do. They're a, they're a gutless, spineless lap dog. So they will take the spineless lap dog and attach it to the whistleblower, and the, they'll befriend the whistleblower. The lap dog, the babysitter, will make it look like I'm your pal, and every day what they're doing is reporting on where the whistleblower went. He had drinks here, met a woman here, whatever it is. They try to discredit the whistleblower at every turn. They have, they have pro- professional organizations that come in and do that. So we know what kind of mechanisms the corporations want that allow them to escape the kind of uh, uh, whistleblower, uh, the attention that they would get from the whistleblower. We know that it works because there's actually a whistleblower provision in the IRS uh, rules 
and that provision is never used. Right. Um, they're trying to put the same provision today in the SEC rules that would allow Wall Street and all the bankers, et cetera, to escape whistleblower protection laws, and then they want to move on and just get rid of the federal false claims. Act. Yeah, and the only time that was done, uh, you know, you and I have handled outrageous cases for decades, Bobby. I mean, well, you've seen it, and I've seen it. But most people, they, they, don't, they only hear the ending of the story, the Glaxo story. For, let me just, for example, I, I yeah, have... Tell us some of yeah, the anecdotes. Some of these cases, I, I, I just made a note, the note... Uh, it's not just Glaxo. Pfizer, $2.3 billion for kickbacks, for off-labeling. A tenant health care, $1 billion for billing violations, payments to Medicare, kickbacks, bill padding, same kind of conduct. HCA, now this is a really interesting one. The governor of the state of Florida was elected governor after his company, uh, uh, Columbia, had been hit for $1.7 billion dollars for fraud. And then in Florida, they elect him governor. But the point is this. What, what was he doing? Well, they were over... Let me point out that Pap is from Florida. <laughs> uh, let, what were they doing? They were upcoding. They were doing... Th they were, what they would do, they would say, okay, you're coming in for a treatment for a cold, but I'm going to put on our billing that you came in for treatment for pneumonia so they can charge the, the government more money. They were doing things like setting offices up for doctors where they were paying that they would tell the doctor I'm going to give you a loan and and you're going to be able to have this loan but they never have the doctor pay it back they'd pay for furniture they'd pay for office buildings so they got hit Merck Merck got hit for kick again kick kickback violations Medicare fraud Medicaid fraud uh, these cases go on forever. It's not just health care. It's, it's not health care. It's, it, it, it's military contractors like uh, Boeing, like Lockheed, like uh, Alliant. Uh, it's, it's the oil industry. It's environmental it, it crimes. Bobby, here's a case right here. It's New York State versus New York City. New York City was hit for half a billion dollars for overbilling the government for classes that they, they were conducting, for uh, for counseling that they were conducting, for people that had speech impairments and physical impairments, for preschool programs. It's not just corporations. Sometimes you even see businesses that, that operating like businesses within a municipality, within a state, where they're ripping off the government too. But, I mean, AstraZeneca, half a billion dollars, false claims, where they were, uh, where they were using an off-label, they were selling an off-label for a product, in giving it to people, it was it was it was a, a psychotic medicine, selling it to people that never should have had it. But the truth is, yes, did the, did the whistleblower get paid a lot of money? Yes, the whistleblower did get paid a lot of money. But how many how many lives did the whistleblower save? How many, how much fraud from uh, from over ta from from taxpayers? Uh, well, paying they, too much the numbers of this that it's twenty-seven billion dollars that the Justice Department has collected from crooked corporations because of whistleblowers since nineteen eighty-six. Twenty-seven billion dollars, and now and that is a tiny fraction of the fraud that the government fraud that's out there. It, and can you I, know, and I do, Bobby? You know, let me there's a lot of re Republicans that say well, we have to be frightened of big government. We're paying too much in taxes, but. The, you know, I, we, we have to be equally frightened of other concentrations of power, the concentration that comes with the influence that some corporations now have, particularly under the Citizens United case, um, and the, the kind of sweetheart relationships that develop between government officials and the corporations with whom they're doing business, and that they rip us all off. Well, here's the best advice I can give, and just to close this, it is this. These people who know something's going on, they can change, they can protect democracy by going forward and reporting it. Now, you know, the, the, how that takes place, the, the reason we've handled so many is because people know we do this. It's kind of a specialized kind of area, granted, but you, you first of all have to commit yourself to, to be willing to do it. And you have to understand, I'm not doing this simply gonna, because I want to make 20% of a billion dollars. That case, your case may not end up a billion dollars, but you have to be committed to the idea that in order for democracy to work, people have to play fair. Well, and Pap, you know, you talk about democracy, and, um, and that's a real connection that people really need to understand. 
When I grew up, I spent a lot of time in Latin America, and uh, and people always wondered how can you know at that time there were no democracies in Latin America, and people would wonder why doesn't democracy work down there? You know, is there something genetically, or is there something about the climate, or whatever? But one of the principal reasons that that scholars and analysts understood why it didn't work is that people had lost faith in their government. They didn't believe that the government was there to serve them. They believed that the government was there, that it was a, that was a, a boys' club of people who just dealt with each other, and they were crooked, and there was nothing any citizen could do about it. And, you know, our country has always been the template for democracy around the world. We're the ones, we invented democracy. Uh, in, in 1776, there was no other democracy. It was unheard of. Even by the Civil War, there were only six democracies in the world. But people were looking at us. And the more and the longer we last and the better we did it, the more people changed. So now most, uh, there's 120 democracies around the world, and they're all based upon our example. And the key to our resilience as a nation is that we've been able to keep corruption at a minimum and we've been able to keep citizen participation at a maximum. And both of those things are things that we're losing today and that are under attack on Capitol Hill. And, you know, if we're going to live up to our own ideals as a nation, as a template for democracy, we've got to make sure that our government functions to serve the public and not serve the special interests. And that corruption is kept at a minimum. In order to do that, we need every American citizen to participate. It's a civic duty to go in and report your corporation if they're ripping off the American taxpayer. People are frightened to do that. And what Lincoln was trying to do is to say to the American people, it's okay. It's patriotic. You need to do this. And it's so important that we're going to actually give you an outsized reward for coming out and doing it. And, you know, Lincoln said something else about our country. He said, America is a great nation because we are a good nation. And he said that if we ever lose that goodness that's part of our DNA, that we'll also lose our greatness as well. And, it, you know, it isn't actually part of our DNA. It's part of a system. The reason that America works is not because we're different or better than other human beings around the globe. It's because we've engineered a system that rewards the best in human behavior and the best in human impulses and tries to subdue the darker side of our nature, what, what Lincoln called the darker angels of our nature. And, you know, we do that through free market capitalism which is rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior to make everybody do, to reward people for doing things that are good for all of us. And the, these whistleblower statutes are so critical and the attacks upon them on Capitol Hill are so malevolent because they go right to the heart of our democracy. And that's why it's important for every American to understand that you've got to participate to keep these whistleblower statutes intact but also, if you're in one of those corporations that's dealing with the American public, that has a sweetheart relationship with some senator or some bureaucrat or some congressman, and you see them doing things that you know are wrong, that you've got to come forward as a moral duty. But not only that, our country, our democracy, is going to reward you for doing it. Before we go this week, I wanted to take a moment to announce that Ring of Fire Radio is now on the air every weekday from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Show is hosted by Ring of Fire's own Sam Cedar, and Pap and Bobby will also be popping up on the program throughout the week. It's everything you love about Ring of Fire every day of the week. And of course, you can still tune into Ring of Fire Radio on the weekends at 3 p.m. Eastern on Saturdays with rebroadcasts on Sundays. You can find a station on our website at ringoffireradio.com. And that's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can get even more stories that the corporate media refuses to talk about on our website at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. I'm Farron Cousins, and for Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.
Hi, I'm Mike Papantonio, host of Ring of Fire on Free Speech TV. The corporate controlled media rakes in millions of dollars in profit every year by only telling you half of the story. They're at the mercy of their corporate sponsors and they refuse to take on corporations that kill, maim, and harm consumers. Here at Free Speech TV, we don't have shareholders, we don't answer to corporate America, and we don't pull any punches. Our loyalty is to the viewers, and our viewers are the ones that help keep Free Speech TV alive. Free Speech TV doesn't take corporate money, and that's why your financial support is so important to us. Viewer voices, not corporate sponsors, fuel Free Speech TV and drive many of our programming decisions. You can help protect Free Speech TV with your donation. Free Speech TV airs independent news and views for independent thinkers like you. Our people-powered programs demonstrate what's possible in our democracy when we unite as workers, as students, as artists, as parents, and partners in progress. More people means more power. Each donation brings more power and programs and more possibilities for change. Our programming equips viewers with vital tools, resources, contacts, and examples of how to collectively build alternative, sustainable solutions to serious community problems. Please donate now and bring these organizing tools into your community. Everyone should have access to news and information that's forming the world around them. Our goal is to keep you and everybody involved. We aim to reach every viewer possible because we're all in this together. Go online to freespeech.org and help support independent, honest news journalism. Your support helps keep information flowing and together we can hold the corporate media more accountable.